Shut up and sit down. Welcome to the Roofer Report, brought to you by Roofer.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Roofer Report. I'm your host, Pete McKendrick, here with Roofer, and uh, very excited to have everybody back here again to uh, tackle another topic in the roofing industry. Uh, you know, uh, an interesting one where we've kind of made a shift here in the podcast a little bit. You know, we, we focused a lot on tech early on and, uh, you know, how to employ tech in your business, what were the best options. And we're really trying to focus more on how can we help you guys successfully run your business, right? And, and, and what tools can we give you? What insight can we give you from successful people uh, in the industry that have done it, probably made a lot of mistakes and who are, uh, you know, have, have figured out a way to, to be successful and, and continue to grow their business. And uh, today we have uh, Robert Burden from um, uh, Raise Solutions. But prior to that, Robert, you can speak a little bit to where you were and how you got to where you are today. Uh, for people that don't know, Raise is a brand new CRM to the market uh, that Robert and his team are bringing to the market, a great product. And uh, I'll let you speak a little bit to that. But give us a little background, Robert, on how you got to where you are today and, and how you got into roofing. Sure, sure. So I always start, you know, the generation before me, um, I come from a roofing family. Um, so my, my father and his three brothers all own their own roofing companies. Uh, so they have a very uh, inspiring story. I, I, it's kind of stuck with us and it's always informed me and kind of my generation's entire lives. So when my father was born in southern Beirut in Lebanon, came to the United States as a refugee, him and his whole family, when he was about 11 years old, barely spoke any English. I, my favorite story, I was laugh thinking about this. He always tells me about he was in the car, you know, driving to school for the first time, and he heard Journey's uh, Wheel in the Sky. And he was just singing at the top of his lungs, like, I had no idea what any of those words meant, but sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, by the time, so that was the context him come to America. By the time he was 17 years old, he was already beginning his own construction projects and he founded his own construction company before even graduating high school. Oh, and wow. that eventually morphed into a roofing company exclusively. That roofing company has been really the, the foundation of beyond business, our family. Uh, so as I mentioned, my three uncles all worked at that company at various times. And then we're able to go on and found their own roofing companies and they're all having success in their own ways. Right now, me and my brothers have all worked there. We have aunts, we have cousins, we have, uh, you know, friends and the roofing company is able to su sustain them and give them gainful employment. And so part of the reason that I founded Raise is because I've seen what roofing can do for families who look at my father, right? Like without even graduating high school, he was able to support himself and his entire family. And so we want to begin helping people be able to divide for their families in that same way. And I, I really do believe, I always say, who starts a roofing company? It's not a venture capitalist. It's more than likely a family business, right? It's funny when I was, you know, graduating high school, I went to college. I was like, I want nothing to do with roofing. I've been around roofing my entire life. I need to get away from it. Um, went to school for a very long time and, uh, 2020 came around, upended everyone's lives. And I just happened to be finishing school at that time. As much as I resisted, I was like, I'm not going back to the roofing company. I'm not going back. Uh, my father was looking for a production manager. You know, this will kind of foreshadow what we'll be talking about. I was having a hard time, like finding somebody to stick in that role and to really, you know, hold it down. Um, and lo and behold, I entered the role. I got to say, it was really transformative. As I mentioned, you know, not wanting to be at the roofing company. I, I, everything I just told you, I was able to appreciate in a higher light, having been in that situation and entering that position, seeing like, oh my goodness, like this is a roofing company, but it's so much more. It is you know, an organization. It's a whole thing. So we also began exploring the possibility of using technology to help us iron out, uh, that company grew rather quickly. So it's been in business about 27 years now, my father's company, wow. um, almost exclusively commercial, you know, maybe doing 
one residential shingle roof a week for the first 25 ish years and has now grown a residential side of the business to be, you know, about 50, 50 commercial residential. Um, and that happened all in about three years. And so I came in, I'd also, you know, while I was in school, worked a few sales jobs here and there, been in some corporate positions and kind of, you know, was analyzing, this is how things tend to operate. This is how people get their folks set up when they bring in new hires. You know, some experiences were great, some were less than great, uh, but was, was able to learn from all of those. And as I got into the role and obviously kind of thrown into the, the flames of production mid season, uh, it was about September, you know, you're doing about, you're trying to do three jobs a day. And, uh, you know, it's like, all right, well, so-and-so's calling and we're short on material here. And, uh, you know, somebody accidentally put their nail gun through the drywall. I don't know if you ever had that one before. Um, <laughs> I kind of took a step back. I was like, hold on. It doesn't need to be this chaotic all the time. Right. And I think it's a, it's a product of having success growing quickly and kind of outgrowing your processes a little too fast. And so there, I think there needs to be that moment where you kind of take a step back and be like, okay, how can we shore this up? Right. And, uh, so kind of working through that process, I was like, well, actually, let me tell you, we met at the IRE this year, right? Yes. Yep. I had a light bulb moment at the IRE because I realized talking to all these contractors, you know, I got the opportunity to speak with hundreds. I was like, oh, every roofing business is like this essentially. Right. And there are <laughs> yeah. exceptions to the rule that. No, it's the truth. Yeah. Yeah. As you mentioned, uh, Raise is my company. We do offer CRM technology, but we are a tech based consulting firm. Uh, we offer a number of services that help roofers to grow their business. I, my favorite two words together are controlled growth. Um, I know a lot of people hear that and like slow growth, but we believe that controlled growth does not necessarily mean slow growth. You can have fast growth, but you can do it in a way that anticipates the challenges that are to come and addresses them in advance. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and I love the topic that we have today because I think they go hand in hand really, right? Like I think one of the biggest challenges that roofers have is finding qualified people. But I think part of the issue that the underlying issue that is missed so many times is that the process isn't there to support the success of the incoming employees. And therefore they're unsuccessful. Therefore there's incredible turnover. Mm -hmm. Therefore it's a lot harder to find somebody to fit that program and come in and be able to hit the ground running because we've never really truly even if we're successful for years, never truly really ironed out the process, right? And I, I think that a lot of times, you know, you, you talked about how you guys started exploring technology. What I found, I came from a CRM background after being a contractor and then going into the tech side of the business, I worked for a CRM and uh, in the industry. And what we found is that so many of these guys had such a hard time translating their process to us right? Because maybe they started as a one man operation. Maybe it was a two person operation for a long time. And maybe that person or those two people really kind of like gelled and knew how to run things. Right. But it really wasn't a process that was easily understood by anyone outside of them, whether it be, you know, the estimating was set up in such a way that it was very difficult for someone outside of maybe one person to estimate a job. Right. Like I remember asking contractors like, well, how do you estimate? You know, where do your numbers come from? And it, oh, it's all up here. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's great unless something happens to you and now you can't estimate any jobs. Right. right. You know, so it was like the little things like that. I think that, you know, when a business has been, especially when a business has been successful, gets overlooked. Right. Because it's like, mm -hmm. well, it's working. So we don't really have to address it. And like you said, kind of coming in, I think from being from the outside and then coming back into the organization and being able to look at that come from kind of an outsider's perspective right? and be like, okay, like there's some things that we need to take a step back, iron them out, get this process under control. And then it will help us with a lot of the other things. A lot of the other things like hiring and training will fall into place because now we have a better process in place. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a piece that so often gets overlooked because it's just like, well, we've always done it this way. It seems to be working. We're successful. We're making money, you know, like they're right. returning a profit. We have been for years. 
Like there's nothing really to address there, but really there could be a lot of holes in that process. And I think that that's a piece that at the foundation of this gets overlooked so many times. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say the beautiful thing about roofing can also be one of the biggest pitfalls to growth is you can have success. You can have a lot of success with a one to two man or one to two person, I should say, operation. But the reality is your ceiling is capped unless you get to that point where you can take what you know, as you were saying in your head, and really put it out on paper and in a way where, okay, this becomes repeatable, becomes predictable. You know, they always use the term scale, right? Predictability is a prerequisite for scale. If you can't know this is what I can expect out of what we're doing here, uh, you can't multiply that, right? You kind of got to identify, all right, this is what's working. This is how we make our money. And this is how we can bring other people in to replicate that process for us. And it's hard because I think there are different stages in a, at a roofing company where what you're looking for in a hire also changes. If you're a solo operator, that first hire is going to be much different than say your fourth or fifth, right? You are looking for somebody who can wear a lot of hats, is open to being a part of just about every aspect of the operation. Um, I think what ties people up as they get to a certain point is being able to draw boundaries for their employees to think as a founder, right? This is your business. This is your baby. Like I'm going to do whatever I have to do to see this thing succeed. But the reality is even that first hire uh, and then especially that fourth and fifth, they might be great employees. They might work really hard, but they're never going to be as committed to seeing the success of your company as you are. Right. And I think that can kind of be like, it can trip people up. I'll I'll say even like, I can see it in my my father sometimes. He's like, well, you know, you just got to kind of like grind through it, right? You just got (laughs) to, you know, we got it all shoulder the load together. And that's all well and good when it's yours. But, you know, for somebody who like, this is my job, like I want to have that work-life balance that everyone cherishes. It's a tough sell, right? You know, I I think speaking to the, the process end of it too, I think that one of the things that gets missed is I think everybody tries to lay out this process and be like, here it is. Like, this is our process. We're going to stick to this no matter what. And as the company evolves and grows and, you know, things change, technology comes into the market that wasn't there before. I think that constantly looking to change that process, not necessarily major changes, but tweak it and be able as the owner of a company, you know, from a high level to look at that, uh, and be able to figure out, okay, here's something that maybe we could do a little bit better. You know, here's something that it works, but maybe we could improve on it a little bit. Uh, you know, like I did a podcast with uh, Bradley Gardner, who, who runs a, a company out of uh, the Southern United States, a very successful uh, insurance restoration company. And, you know, one of, he, one of the things that he said is now that I've scaled my company to being about a $20 million a year company, I'm bored. He said, but at the same time, he goes, because the company is literally running itself. He said, but at the same time, what it's given me the opportunity to do is take this really high level look and be able to see the whole big picture and tweak the process and make it better and better as the days go on. Because where before I was more in it, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was like dealing with, you know, short materials and running to the supplier and I'm on the roof and who knows doing what else, you know, being able to take that step back now he's seeing it in a much different way and he's able to really evolve the process, you know? And I think that's one, right. something that gets overlooked, you know, the process that works for you as a two man operation might not work when you get to be a 10 or 15, 20 man operation. Right? right. And you may have to tweak it a little bit, you know, and I think that obviously that will change how the employees come into it. Um, I think speak a little bit to y- your family's business and what, as you guys did build a process, what were some of the obstacles that you guys ran into as far as like processing, getting adoption from your employees? Yeah. Um, Well, I wanted to hit on on something that that you mentioned, right? Which is having this ability to sort of take this high level view and really to sort of step back from the chaos of the day to day. I think, and and this is something that, that my family's company encountered also is, I think one of the difficulties with getting to that stage is oftentimes the person who starts a roofing company is doing sales. Um, and so they're heavily involved, right? So especially on the, if you're doing it on the commercial side, especially, right? Cause you might have repeat accounts that, you know, they're like, I trust you to handle my business. Right. And you know, it might be your son, it might be your brother, 
but they're not you. I want you overseeing this, making sure everything gets done right. And at the same time, you're thinking, well, yeah, I trust me more than I trust any of these guys too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think that can be a challenge to overcome is, is getting to a point where you can begin to sort of let the reins go and to find people, right? And it's just going to keep going back to like, if you can find good people, it is such a value to your company, people that you can trust to say like, look, I'm giving you this responsibility to see this thing through, right? And just know like, all right, I, I believe they'll do it. And I think one of the biggest challenges that my family's company faced was getting burned a few times, right? And it's, you know, you know, you lick your wounds and you move on, but it, you got to learn that lesson, right? And kind of really work through like, how do we make sure, you know, the people that we have in place are the people that we are going to be able to trust with, with this business, right? That's why, you know, it being a family industry, um, there is this inclination, like I can trust my family, right? So I'm, I'm going to put, you know, whether it's, again, my brother, my wife, my, my sons, they're going to be the ones who are in positions to make big decisions. And that comes with its own set of complications as you continue to grow. Cause you run out of, you run out of, uh, run out of family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's very interesting. I had a contractor say to me once, you know, we were talking kind of about something similar and he said, you got to trust the process first, right? You can't, it's almost impossible to train and trust the employees. If you don't trust the process first, you can't be worrying about what the process is doing. He says it's a lot easier if you learn to trust the process and now you you feel like you can trust that and you can stick to that. And now you can plug those employees in where their strengths meet the process, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a, you know, a really smart insight into it. Uh, you know, and I think that it helps with his hiring. Uh, so speak, I guess, a little bit to how you guys, where have you guys found people, right? I mean, outside of the family, obviously, you guys, like you said, at some point you're exhausting family yeah. members, but yeah, where right. did you guys, where did you guys find success in finding employees? Contractors talk to contractors, right? And we, we do have, one of the beautiful things about our industry is we're able to build a network. There's a lot of like-mindedness. And um, so I think opportunities uh, come along. It's a matter of being able to recognize. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was getting ready to move out of the production role, you know, we obviously began a search for uh, so for somebody to step into that production management role, you know, did the standard post on Indeed. One thing that gets overlooked sometimes is actually the creation of a job listing is a huge part of uh, bringing in good talent. Uh, <laughs> there's more to it than you think. Just like, oh yeah, we need a production manager. You're going to do all our scheduling, manage everything. Come on in. Uh, we'll pay you a salary, right? Uh, there is, uh, it's part art, part science. There's a bit to it, but, but to stay on my current strain of thought, so, you know, we got in about six quality applications, some junk, you know, went through the interview process. Turned out that there was a, a gentleman who was working uh, as a warehouse manager for one of our suppliers who had formerly run a roofing company down in, we're, we're up in Northern Illinois, had ran, you know, multi-million dollar roofing company down in Miami doing hurricane work decades ago, moved here for family reasons, felt as though, you know, they'd kind of gotten as far as they could in their current position, was looking for something new, came in, was an immaculate fit. Shout out Luis, happy to have you. Um, <laughs> and so it became pretty clear this would be a great hire. But one thing I would definitely recommend to anyone listening who's going through hiring, when you find that good one, don't let that stop you from seeing your process through. So if you have four interviews lined up, go ahead and, and move forward. Even if you're like 99% sure we got our person because what ended up happening with us is that the day after having that interview and kind of come to, to the uh, realization, this is our guy got another really interesting application on my desk. I was like, uh, I could have him in pretty sure it wouldn't be for anything, but let's go ahead and have him in. Came in, had immaculate, um, credentials, great history, was a manager, uh, at a, prior construction company, general manager, there had been, you know, some trouble with, you know, we'd grown our sales team from two to six on the residential side. And, uh, you know, they were kind of lacking a little bit of direction. It kind of just popped in my head. This, while not the right person for production, was actually a great fit to be a sales manager here. 
So, you know, after conducting that initial interview, called my parents in and said, Hey, um, so yeah, you know, Luis is our guy, but I think, you know, this guy has enough, there's a place for him here. And so it just kind of ended up being a perfect fit. We ended up creating a, a position. And now I can tell you our sales team over the moon excited to have kind of this dynamic duo in the production room of, of a really solid production manager to make sure that their jobs are running really smoothly. And also a sales manager who's holding them to account, who's creating the process and who's there also as a resource. If they have questions on what do I do about, you know, this, this kind of funky cut here, how do I quote that out? That they know they have someone to go to. And I think when you get that, and there's a time and place for it, right? But I think when you get to that stage where you can say, we have resources for you, hiring for sales becomes a lot easier because a lot of these guys are out here used to hit the ground running, knock as many doors, go get us some business, you're on your own. But to know that you have you know, resources, you have, you know, training's a big part of what we do too. You know, bring manufacturers in, bring suppliers in to, to talk about product knowledge and to really grow that. I think that can do a lot in terms of establishing a culture. And I think when you feel like you're part of a company culture, you get, you get excited about working, right? You're going to have hard days. Roofing is a hard industry. It's never not going to be a hard industry, but uh, you feel like you're in it together, right? Now, do you guys find more success hiring within the industry, like finding people that have a lot of experience in the industry, or have you guys have found success going outside of roofing to find someone to fill one of these, you know, fill some of these roles? Yeah. So I think it, it obviously depends on the role. So I think, if you have sales ability, you can be a successful salesperson in the roofing industry, right? Obviously, the more you learn about the industry and getting that product knowledge, the better you're going to be. But I know quite a number of sales people who, you know, are pretty green, but they can go out and they can land contracts, you know, if they're given the chance to talk to somebody, right? But you do have those key hires, obviously on your installer side, I think that goes without saying. But anyone in your production room, if industry experience is almost a requirement, I mean, it is a requirement, right? It's hard to have somebody running your scheduling, talking to your crews, right? Your crews will be able to like see right through somebody who's kind of like, right. yeah, something <laughs> about shingles and uh, yeah. <laughs> on the ladder, right? It depends the stage you're at. But I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, office staff. You know, we have an in-house accounting person. Industry knowledge helps, no doubt, but sure, it just depends on the role. Yeah, I mean, you made two points that I want to go back and kind of touch on. The first one being culture, right? And how important, obviously, culture for you guys was probably huge because so much family involved, right? That very much uh, that feeling of everyone buying into what you guys were looking to accomplish. But as you started to grow and add employees outside of the family and, and how did you guys, what did you guys do to maintain that cultural aspect and, uh, and continue to build that culture to really make everyone feel like they wanted to be a champion of the company? Yeah. The short answer would be to take care of your people. Like I said, uh, there are, you know, you do run into this quite often where it's, if you're in a commission only role, that's kind of industry standard, but, um, which is fine. Right. No knock on that, but kind of the sense of like, I'm out here to do my job. I'm going to get paid for doing my job and then I'm going to go home and that's the end of it. You can go either way on this. I do think the majority of companies go the 1099 route with their sales. My family's company actually goes W2 with the sales um, and offers health insurance. There's a time and place where that becomes something worth exploring, I think. But I think that's been a big part of building culture is, is a sense of, you know, we're going to take care of you. We want you to be invested in what we're doing here. And I think that helps to work against, as you know, you know, there are cases in our industry where you, know, you have somebody who's working for you, who's, you, we've run into, so we've run into this too, right? And it was one of those lessons where you had to learn working for you, but also working for somebody else. Unfortunately, that's something that happens, right? Uh, but I think when you create a situation where your people feel taken care of, and people 
tell us like, obviously the family members say this, but even the non-family members say it feels like family here. When people leave, it's almost a guarantee that within about three to six months, they're going to ask to come back. Uh, I can I can document at least seven cases of that just in the last calendar oh, wow. year. Uh, and it's a good feeling to have, right? And it's, you know, as I started out by saying, um, this roofing company is more than just a business to my family. It has been the foundation of of our family in a lot of ways. And I think, you know, we have the benefit with that history of just extending that to everyone who's involved. If somebody is, you know, having health issues and isn't able to get out and and drum up sales or isn't able to come in for work. We try and be understanding with that. I mean, obviously the last couple of years have have done a lot to a lot of people and uh, everyone's dealing with, with their own, with their own issues. Um, So being understanding with that, also building that into the process though, building that into the structure of your company, holding events. So we do, you know, the annual company holiday parties. We do, you know, uh, drawings here and there. We have incentives for for trips if you hit your sales goals. Just things to get people excited too. I think that most, I don't know, would you say that most people or most companies have some element to that? Or do you think that's something that... Yeah, I mean, I think that it's something that everybody strives for. I don't think that it's something maybe that everyone is successful at, right? Yeah. I, think that, yeah. I think the idea is there. I think the execution sometimes is missed. Um, you know, I think uh, in theory, everybody kind of knows they should do that or want to do that, Mm -hmm. uh, with their employees. But I think sometimes that, you know, sometimes the process or, you know, the way the business is being run inhibits the ability to really take care of the employees. Right. And I think that that's where a lot of, you know, hiring type of issues come from, you know, is you get these employees that maybe come in even with a great attitude and, and want to be loyal and want to excel at the company, but then maybe the process fails them. Maybe because of the process, it's chaotic or unorganized and and puts the employee in an issue where, you know, they become kind of disenchanted with the process and, and unhappy where they're at. And then they move on. Right. And I think that that, you know, takes us all the way back to the beginning of talking about how important that process really is. And, you know, it plays into right into this of like, you know, that having a process that really is supportive of the employees is what's really going to make them shine and is what's really going to make them comfortable in that role and and become part of the family and and feel like they have a stake in what they're doing and, uh, you know, can can feel like they're supported and and able to be successful regardless of, you know, whether they're green to the industry or whether they're a seasoned professional in roofing. You know, I think either way, you know, I've seen plenty of companies where they bring in people that have great knowledge, right? But the process is so messed up or, or so unorganized that their knowledge is essentially not taken advantage of yeah. or not utilized like it should, you know? Um, so I guess speak a little bit to, cause it's another point that you touched on earlier that I really wanted to talk about and that's your training, right? Mm-hmm. I love that you guys said you bring people in, right? I think mm-hmm. that's a, a big one. You know, talk a little bit about your training. How do you guys continue to train and continue to improve for your employees and, and how have the employees enjoyed having the ability to constantly learn? Like, has it, has it been something that they've really latched onto? Do they enjoy that part of it? Uh, and what do you guys do for them in that case? Yeah, I think that the training is probably one of the more popular aspects of, of being a, a member of the sales team. You know, we have both on residential and commercial regularly, at least monthly, you know, someone will come in, Not only that, it's beyond training. It's also updates on the state of the industry, material availabilities. And I think it really helps to get team members invested in feeling like not only you're part of this company, but you're part of a bigger industry. There is a sense of community at large. And I think that's something that's also often lost is, you know, you get the sense like I'm going, I'm going to work, I'm going to grind it out. Uh, But if you feel like you know, it actually helps even with the the competitive aspect too. It's like, I'm part of this industry and I want to outperform everybody else in this industry as well. But going back to the training. So, you know, I kind of set out a four-step process. I use an acronym. Some people love acronyms. Some people hate them, but I'll go with it. When it comes to making safe hires and safe hires being somebody I would qualify as somebody who's going to bring a long-term value to your company, it starts with setting expectations. And that starts at the hiring 
process. So we talked, we mentioned briefly about creating job listings. I think it's really, really important to take advantage from the, from the get go to identify these will be your primary responsibilities working in this role. You'll likely have some secondary responsibilities. And I think this is a part that companies looking to grow struggle with is because you have sort of this, we're all in this together mentality that it can create a lot of havoc if there is a lack of definition to like, what am I primarily responsible for here? Um, I know I need to help out whenever I can, but like, how am I being evaluated? How, how am I to understand whether I'm doing a good job at what I'm supposed to be? It's always an, a red flag if, you know, more than a month into the job, and I've, I've heard this happen with some of the companies that I've worked with, if, if over a month in, there's a question of, I'm not exactly sure what my job is here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, I know what my title is, but like, what am I supposed to be doing? So in order to avoid that situation, the first step is definitely set very clear expectations, make it understood. These are the incentives for doing what you're supposed to do. These are the consequences for falling short. And then that next step is really acclimating the new hires. So that's where the training comes in. I think a lot of times folks who are making hires default to, well, okay, you can ride along, just kind of watch me, see what I'm doing. And that, that should be a part of it, right? Uh, I have an education background. So I was a teacher for about seven years before coming back into the roofing industry. So we talk about gradual release as an instructional method, which is in the simplest terms, I do something, then we do something, and then you do something, right? So it's sort of, it does start with the observation, right? This is how it's done. But then to have that next step of, we're going to sit down and work through this together and sort of gradually give the independence to your new hire to be able to perform on their own. And then even in that, that last segment that you do, it's not as though, all right, now you're thrown to the wolves. Come to me if you run into any problems, right? It's, you know, weekly to bi-weekly check-ins. So what went well this week? Where did you run into problems this week? How can we work through that, right? And even before you get to that stage, I, I do recommend building at least a one-week training regimen, which is very formal, very classroom-ish, which I know is like Red Cross for a lot of you guys like keep anything classroom oriented, keep it away from me. But, you know, if your company is using a tech uh, CRM system or is using technology, uh, that should be taught before someone gets into the bones of doing their day-to-day activity. And I don't think that's something that should be done sort of learning on the fly. Uh, if you have certain procedures in terms of filing paperwork, where do my receipts go? Where do my contracts go? You know, these are things that should be addressed before anyone even gets into into doing, you know, their day to days. And then, so you are, you actually touched on step three, which is follow through. So when you set those expectations, you have the opportunity because your new hire comes in thinking, all right, this is what it's like to work here. They told me I'll be doing this, this, and this, and these are how I go about doing that. But that sort of expectation of what it's like to, to perform well in that role will deteriorate quickly. If they see like, oh, okay, well, they said, if I don't do this, then this happens, but it didn't happen. So uh, I'm fine. Right. So there has to be the follow through. You have to identify at your organization, who's the enforcer for this. Right? It might not be the owner because the owner has a lot going on. Right. But, you know, if you have a management team or if, you know, you have that second partner who's kind of more on the office side of things, you know, make it very clear. Like it's, it's on us to ensure that the things that we want to see happening are being enforced. And then the last step which kind of ties into the culture question is to elevate the perception of the role, Uh, which is to say, you know, the things like training, the things like making people feel like part of something bigger than I go to work, put in my, you know, nine to 12 hours and clock out. Uh, And that's where culture is established. I'm not just a salesman. I'm not just a roofer. I'm not just, no, I'm part of this organism, this living, breathing thing. And we're working towards something together. I love that. Yeah, I think that that's a huge piece, right? And I think, so, like you said, so many times we get to probably like halfway through that, right? We feel like we've got this employee acclimated and it's just like, 
you know, go nuts. You're on yeah. your own. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're and busy. I don't have time for this. Right? <laughs> yeah. But again, it goes back to the process, right? If you have right. that process, like uh, that person you referred to earlier, the company runs itself. Yeah. Once you get to that stage, it's worth the investment up front to build the process out. Yeah. And I love the fact that you guys are continuing to train and educate, you know, because I think that's another piece that sometimes gets missed. And and it's funny because all the successful companies that I've been able to experience their process and be involved with all do the same thing. And that's where they have this continuing education piece and they strive to continuously, uh, you know, keep their employees in the loop of what's going on in the industry, educate them about, you know, new processes, new materials, new technology, uh, bring things in for their employees to try to get their feedback, you know, as far as like maybe new tech or something that could potentially change the, the process a little bit, you know, so you get that uh, investment from them because they feel like they're part of building that process and improving the process because now you're asking for their feedback and you're, they're getting to try the things and they're getting to learn alongside of, of the company. And, and now they're seeing the company grow, but they're growing with the company and it just all kind of plays together. So, yeah, uh, you know, but ultimately at the end of the day, it really goes back to the root of it, which is, you know, you got to have those processes in place, like bringing an employee in, like you said, if you don't have at least a week long regiment of, you know, very distinct things and very distinct ex expectations of what you want that uh, employee to learn up front, you know, that's, that's a process, you know, it, it's a hiring and training process. If you don't have that process set, now you've already lost that employee, right? Like that employee, like you said, that employee is going to be down the road a month later going, I'm not even sure what I'm doing here, right? Yeah. Because I didn't learn it from day one, right? I never had that direction. So, you know, I think, like you said, those processes are key to the success of everything, right? Not only the production and the scheduling and the, you know, the way our sales force operates, but specifically the hiring and the training and, and getting these people to be long-term employees. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'll say an, an added benefit when you're able to establish this culture. One, one of the things I love about my father's company, every time I go in there, is everyone feels as though their ideas are heard. And so they're open to sharing like, hey, you know, I, we keep running into this. What do you think about handling, you know, putting this into place, right? And then it becomes also, you know, I, I mentioned you need that enforcer, which I don't think that goes away, but it almost becomes a group enforcement like, hey, yeah. this keeps happening. What are we going to do about this? Hey, let's have a meeting. Let's figure out what's going on here, which is great to see that buying in that investment. And especially so, you know, obviously, as I mentioned, I, I'm working on the tech development side, too. So I get the opportunity. They come to me with ideas also like, hey, you know, it'd be great. You know, <laughs> this could work yeah. this way, too. You know, oh, you built that out. But I think, you know, you also miss this. You should be adding that in there, too. <laughs> hey, I'll take that. Definitely. Well, and let's touch on that. Like, how have you guys, obviously, your dad being in business for 27 years, probably started very, you know, pen and paper, very, mm -hmm. everything very manual process. How have you guys seen your business evolve with tech and how has it affected the employees? Like has, you know, how the employees bought into it and how has it affected, you know, numbers of employees needed? Uh, you know, how much more effective is it? How, you know, has made using tech, has it made the employees more efficient, which has made their life easier, which has made that buy into that culture better. You know, yeah. like speak a little bit to how you guys have, have brought tech on because I know you guys have obviously here and, and, right. and what has, what has that done for the business from a, from an employee and a culture standpoint? Yeah. So I think there's, so I want, I'll take one a minor step back. So, you know, we talked a lot about building a company by hires, but there's also a stage where, you know, you're not just bringing on new people, but you're also building teams within your organization. So, you know, you have your sales team, you'll have your production team and, you know, you have your, your office slash accounting team. And that adds another layer of complexity uh, because you're no longer just managing people. You're managing almost, you know, three separate entities within one business. And so one of the solutions that we built to address the team aspect was, you know, we kept running into this issue where you know, sales was doing a great job going out landing contracts, but getting the information necessary to have a successful and efficient build in terms of having teams to manage, it's a matter of, 
you know, now you have, you used to have, all right, this guy talks to this guy talks to this guy. Now you have this team has to get, you know, contract or job over to this team who then has to move it over to this team. And what we found was that there were gaps in that communication between teams. And I think this is something that comes with growth. It's a classic growing pain. All right. So you have communication ironed out between your sales team. Maybe you have a sales manager and your, and your sales reps and, and they're operating smoothly, but there's a disconnect between sales and production or production and accounting. Uh, so even when I was in production, uh, I would feel like, all right, well, the job's finished. Everything's done, buttoned up. I feel good. I would, you know, take the, the folder file and put it in a sleeve that says, you know, payment pending on the wall. And then it would sit there and sit there. And there was no process in place to let uh, the people responsible for accounting know like, oh, we can go collect on that job. So we had, you know, it came to the end of the year and it's like, wow, we have, you know, 50 some jobs that are, have been done, but need to collect on. So uh, in designing our CRM system, you know, we, we really kept in mind, how can we put together a process that moves from start to finish, meaning lead generation all the way through to job costing, right? And to build in notifications. The beautiful thing about technology is it can actually become your enforcer. Uh, if it is de designed the right way, right? So you can put in fail safes, you can put in notifications and folks are getting pinged on their phone or to their email saying, hey, it's time to do this or this job, your commission, whatever it is, will not happen until you do this thing, right? And so there's kind of this push from behind, like, right. all right, we got to move through the process. We got to sure. move through to the next stage. And even just to have it very clearly laid out, like, oh, this is where we start and this is where we finish because all roofing companies operate the same way, right? You land the sale, you do the build and you collect. That's the fundamental core, right? So if you can iron out, you know, okay, I know I'm knocking doors, you know, I'm thinking I need to go, you know, and, and it also depends company to company. Some sales reps are responsible for everything from start to finish including collecting that final check and some companies, right. It's just go land contracts, go land contracts. But, um, you know, as long as you have an idea of the scope of your responsibility and what it takes to actually get that done, I think technology can be a great resource in terms of laying that out. Yeah. And I love one of the things that you said there, it, it becoming like your enforcer. I remember when I started working on the CRM side, one of the biggest, things that contractors would tell us is I love this for accountability mm -hmm. reasons, right? It, it takes the way me having to constantly babysit or constantly police everybody because the CRM is essentially doing it for me now, you know, whether it be through communication, whether it be through just having that visibility on what they're doing in the process now, you know, allowed the, the owner or the management team, to just have this like overview now and not have to be, you know, hunting people down to make sure things were getting done. Right. Because I could look quickly at my CRM and see whether or not things were getting done. Right. So it, right. it became this accountability feature that they needed just as much as the, you know, process itself and, and being able to have that visibility, the accountability piece was huge for them because it streamlined the accountability. Like you said, you know, I don't have to, ride with my salesman to make sure he's doing his sales yeah. correctly. I can look there and see if he's executing the steps now, like we taught him. Yep. Right. So, uh, you know, that's a huge piece to streamlining their day and streamlining the operation. Yeah. I'll give, I'll give an example of, uh, I'll never, <laughs> so we designed a door knocking app as part of our CRM and the sort of the inspiration for that was I was sitting with my dad and I was like, so, you know, you have a pretty big sales team now how do you know how many doors they've knocked like in a week or, or he's like, honestly, I have no clue. <laughs> and I, it just kind of, it struck me. I was like, this is really the engine of your business, right? Like this is what you're relying on to, to keep the, the whole machine operating. And, you know, we're fortunate enough to have guys that we trust and you know, that we, you know, who produce so that it's not like a dire issue. But I just thought to myself, I was like, this is something as an owner, I would want to, to know down to the T, like, 
And the other thing that it allows you to do is you can then set expectations. Again, going back to setting expectations, you know, it's peak season here. We should be knocking at least as many doors a week. And now there's a tool that can ensure that, you know, we're hitting these numbers. And that goes then back to what it takes to scale a business, right? Because if you know, if you knock 50 doors, you'll land five contracts, those rough numbers. Then you know, if you knock 200 doors, you'll, you'll land 20, right? And that's that predictability that you're looking for that you can then say with confidence, all right, I can hire out a bigger sales team. I can hire out, you know, an additional two, three crews and really, you know, put gas on this thing. Um, but that predictability has to come first. Yeah. I like that. I, I, that's a great piece. I mean, I really want to appreciate you coming on, Robert. I'm we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. But, uh, you know, I think some great information. I think obviously a lot of great uh, experience for you guys, uh, you know, having been in this business for so long as a family. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure you guys have experienced just about everything you could possibly experience as a roofing uh, company owner, <laughs> yeah. you know. And now, and now being on the, on the development side and on the tech side, you know, I think it gives you guys some great, some great insight into, uh, you know, building a product that'll be successful, you know, being tied to that roofing company. And, and like you said, having seen where it went, where it came from, you know, with, with your dad starting it at, you know, still in high school to now and, and what you can do to potentially help him even continue to possibly grow it. it it's great. You know, it's great knowledge to have and it's great experience to be able to share today. So I really appreciate you. Doing yeah. And I, I really, really appreciate you having me on Pete. It's been uh, a real pleasure. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, I've over the last, you know, five ish years, I've really come to appreciate what roofing can mean to a family. Uh, obviously I used to do everything I could to stay away from it, but it really is. It is something that anyone can get involved in. If you hustle, you can have success. And then once you have some success, you know, if you are able to implement these processes we've been talking about, there is really no cap to what you can, you can achieve. Yeah, man, I really appreciate it. I think, you know, like I said, I think that's a great, a great thing to look at. You know, I think it is, uh, you know, an industry that is really wide open for anybody to, to really take advantage of, like you said, if you got some hustle and, and you got a little bit of, of smarts and you really focus on that, process and, and building it correctly from the beginning, you know, there's really no end to what you can accomplish in this industry. And it's a great, uh, you know, a great thing to shoot for, especially if you're someone new listening to this, that is either just started out in roofing or potentially even thinking maybe you're a sales guy and you're thinking of breaking off like your uncles did and starting your own deal. Like, you know, that's the, these are important things to know. And, uh, like I said, some great, some great knowledge here that, today from you. And I really appreciate that. Robert. Yeah. Do you mind if I throw a quick plug in? No, no, go for it, man. <laughs> also, I wonder, did you hear, have you heard about the lawyer who quit law and moved into roofing? That's how great the opportunity is right now. It really is. If you, and as somebody who, obviously, if they're practicing law, they have that discipline to really like think through the process side. Oh, man, possibilities are But anyways, for, for any contractors out there who feel that, you know, they're, hitting a wall with their growth or who are interested in kind of unleashing their growth potential, uh, I'd encourage you to visit raisetheroof.com. It's R-A-E-S, theroof.com. Uh, we offer a number of services from digital marketing to hiring, uh, even helping you find subcontractors and all that in addition to our flagship CRM service. So we're always eager to help other family companies have the success that, that we've been blessed to have ourselves. Awesome. Awesome story, Robert. And thank you so much for, uh, for being on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks Pete. I appreciate it too. All right. Uh, be sure to check us out on the roofer report every other Tuesday. Uh, lots of great content coming from lots of great guests like Robert. And, uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next time.